Why would we integrate at all? Why would we pursue a whole life? Why would we bother living a life rich in experiences, if not in fiat currency? I will start with the assumption that monetary wealth is beyond most of us. Furthermore, I assume that fiat currency is not our highest priority. During my final decade in the classroom, I pushed an integrative agenda, attempting to bridge C.P. Snow's eponymous Two Cultures essay from 1959 in a manner consistent with Edward O. Wilson's 1998 book, Consilience, I required every student in each of my science courses to complete a significant piece of art or literature as a major part of their grade. Naturally, the students hated the exercise and despised me until the projects were complete and shared with the entire class, at which point the students unanimously agreed it was the most important activity they had ever conducted in college. University administrators uniformly detested the exercise and just about everything else that happened in my classrooms, and this was even before universities had become widely recognized as money-making scams reflective of the entire culture. From a personal perspective, the process of classroom-based integration caused me to lose my strictly reason-driven way and encouraged me to venture deep into the emotional abyss of feeling and understanding. Therein lies the dilemma I face. Perhaps you face it too. As a reasonably knowledgeable rationalist, I am virtually alone. My efforts to educate people about the ongoing mass extinction event and abrupt climate change have brought me more disappointment than success. I'd like you, you to learn from my experiences. This idea takes me to the first point of this short presentation. Why are we here? Kurt Vonnegut quoted two different people in respond to that, responding to that question. He quotes his son Mark in saying, we are here to help each other through this, whatever this is. I think that's beautiful. Kurt Vonnegut quotes his uncle in saying, we are here to fart around and don't let anybody tell you any different. Two very different perspectives on why we are here. Or are they? Maybe they're not as dissimilar as we think. The question probably arises for you, why am I here? For me, at least, I am a teacher. This is who I am. This is not merely what I do. Whether it's in classrooms or in workshops, my life and my life's work is teaching. Consider this example from a couple of years ago. Mary had taken my class 18 years earlier, and then we met after those 18 years had passed on a, on a beach in Florida. She had moved many times, she had gotten married, she had had many life di disruptions, and through it all, she held on to this significant piece of art that she had created for my conservation biology class. All those years later, she held on to it and brought it when we were going to meet. And when we met, she cried, and I cried, and sea level rose, and so apparently that's all my fault. I'm here because I'm a teacher. I want to talk a little bit about Milankovitch cycles and climate change. Milankovitch cycles are important in the deep past in terms of the implications for the planet warming or cooling. When Earth comes out of an ice age, the warming is not initiated by carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but by changes in Earth's orbit. The warming causes the oceans to release carbon dioxide. The additional carbon dioxide mixes in the atmosphere and then acts as a greenhouse gas to amplify warming. In other words, a slight but predictable wobble in the Earth's rotation causes the release of a potent greenhouse gas from the ocean into the atmosphere, thereby causing warming, and this occurred in the deep past. And about 90% of the warming occurred in the deep past after that carbon dioxide was released from the ocean into the atmosphere. As I indicated, about 90% of the warming occurs after the carbon dioxide is released from the ocean into the atmosphere. That same phenomenon is observed during an El Nino Southern Oscillation event. As you can see here, the El Nino Southern Oscillations are indicated by red and take the temperature above the zero line. The La Nina cycles, opposite of El Nino cycles, cause cooling of the atmosphere and therefore of the planet. 
So it's a similar phenomenon as we observe with the Milankovitch cycle, but the scales, of course, are very different. Here on the top, you can see the El Nino. On the bottom right, you see the Milankovitch cycle. And you see the same sorts of patterns, but in the lower cases, stretched out over hundreds of thousands of years instead of just a couple of decades. In addition, the same phenomenon occurs when we burn fossil fuels for many decades, or in the case, in our case, for nearly three centuries now, burning fossil fuels at a relatively large scale. I presented many of the causes and consequences of abrupt climate change, which is a little different than the climate change I've been talking about so far. I presented those at NatureBats Last, which you can find at GuyMcPherson.com. The consequences include things like higher temperatures, more droughts, fires, volcanoes, earthquakes, oh my, all sorts of phenomena shown here, and others as well. A primary difficulty we have as human animals is our inability to understand and appreciate the exponential function. So I'm going to use a short video clip here to demonstrate the importance of the exponential function, albeit in this case for physical phenomena instead of biological or ecological phenomena. Everybody knows about playing with dominoes, but what you may not know is that a domino can knock over another domino, which is about one and a half times larger. So what I have here is a chain of dominoes. Each one is one and a half times larger than the previous one. And the smallest domino is about five millimeters high and one millimeter thick. And I will carefully place it. And there are 13 dominoes. And the largest domino, it weighs about 100 pounds and is more than a meter tall. Ready? Boom. That was 13 dominoes. If I had 29 dominoes, the last domino would be as tall as the Empire State Building. I think we can conclude, based on our lack of understanding of the ex exponential function, as well as a lack of understanding about the place of humans on a very complex, bi bi geographically rich planet, that mistakes have been made. We, we began storing grains and therefore increasing our ability to lock up the food so that certain people have access to power that they never had before. We started doing that a few thousand years ago. We've been mismanaging lands for at least that length of time. We have messed with what could have been a beautiful mass transportation system and instead seem to have become addicted to the automobile. And as indicated in the lower right panel, we have compartmentalized our lives. We have put ourselves into silos and created disincentives for individuals who wish to go out of one silo and into another or integrate knowledge from different silos. So those are among the terrible mistakes we've made as a species. There are many, of, many more, of course, but there's no time machine to take us back so that we can correct those errors. We can only understand them and perhaps individually learn to live differently as a result of them. And of course, there's the ongoing error that has us here in the United States spending nearly half of the societal spending at uh, the, the level of the country on the military. What is called defense here, but really has become offense, and it's certainly offensive. And so instead of spending money on things that help the people, we spend money on things that help a relatively few individuals who are in positions of power. The question arises, now what? Now what do we do? What do we do? What do I do? What do you do? What do we do as individuals, as members of families, as part of a community, as part of society? The desert anarchist American writer Edward Abbey wrote, if the situation is hopeless, there's nothing to worry about. And he's not suggesting giving up, whatever that might mean. And he said many times, action is the antidote to despair. So instead of despairing, we might just as well take action. In fact, 
If the situation is hopeless, there's nothing to worry about, and that allows us to break free of our shackles. As indicated in the lower right panel, we have a chain, and we can break out away from that chain and take flight into a future, into, soci into a society that might well be short, but that still allows us to pursue a meaningful life. For me, for these last several years, my pursuit has been that of planetary hospice. And I'm going to quote Stephen Jenkinson, who, according to Stephen Jenkinson, was involved in the death trade for nearly all of his adult life. He points out that the great enemy of grief is hope. Hope is the four-letter word for people who are unwilling to know things for what they are. Our time requires us to be hope-free, to burn through the false choices of being hopeful and hopeless. They are two sides of the same con job. Grief is required to proceed. And I would argue that, based on the definition of hope, which is to cherish a desire with anticipation to want something to happen to be true, that's a wish. That's an absolute wish. I think if we're going to participate in the grief that is required to proceed, then we also should be participating in grief recovery. Grief is wishing for a different past. Like hope, it's wishful thinking. To get stuck in that different past is to become mired in inaction and the inability to pursue a reflective whole life. How instead shall we proceed? I have proposed for the last few years planetary hospice. And taking advantage of this information, I'm going to briefly describe what I mean by planetary hospice at three different levels. First of all, the personal level, the level that we spend most of our times in, with family and friends. Why not treat our family and friends as we treat our beloved elderly grandmother, with great respect, with great honesty, and with great love? I think that would be a wonderful start if we're looking for a way to pursue a more significant and whole life with those that we love. At the next level of interaction, the community level, planetary hospice, at least to me, means overcoming racism, misogyny, homelessness, and other community level challenges. And I've used a, in particular, this one diagram to indicate that Simple poverty doesn't explain everything that's going on. Racism is rampant in every version of civilization so far. So why would we expect it to not be rampant in this particular version of civilization? The global industrial model. Of course it's rampant, as is misogyny, homelessness, and numerous other community-level challenges. What about the next level up, beyond our individual lives, beyond our family and friends, and beyond the people we interact with on a more regular basis within our community. What is the, about at the level of society? I have one suggestion, and that is to decommission nuclear power plants before they melt down catastrophically and thereby threaten all life on Earth with extinction. So then, what shall we do? What is worth doing? I, I agree with the statement in the very end, civilizations perish because they listen to their politicians and not to their poets. And the politicians, meanwhile, are listening to people with a lot of money. So I suspect the politicians, in our case, are listening to the bankers, perhaps better called banksters, because they are gangsters who happen to be in the banking business. So the question then arises, what shall we do? What is worth doing? And for me, at least, that's rooted in the question, why are we here? And so I returned to this question posed by Kurt Vonnegut and, re and responded to Vonnegut by his son, Mark, and also by his uncle, who remains unnamed. Kurt Vonnegut says, go into the arts. I'm not kidding. The arts are not a way to make a living. They are a very human way of making life more bearable. Practicing an art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, for heaven's sake. This from an atheist, no less. Sing in the shower, dance to the radio, tell stories, write a poem to a friend, even a, even a lousy poem. Do it as well as you possibly can. 
you will get an enormous reward. You will have created something. And that is an enormous reward based on my own limited experiences. What then shall we do? What is worth doing? Bearing in mind what Homer wrote in the Iliad some 2,800 years ago, any moment might be our last. Everything is more beautiful because we are doomed. You will never be lovelier than you are now. We will never be here again. And Homer is, in, in the previous sentences, points out that we mortal humans have a wonderful life. And it's wonderful because any moment might be our last. As a consequence, everything is more beautiful for us than it is for the gods. The gods are jealous of mortal humans because the gods put up with the same phenomena year after year after decade after century after millennium with no change. Why bother stopping to smell the roses if you know the roses will be there for another few million years for you? Finally, I point to Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American transcendental philosopher. The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have made some difference that you have lived and lived well. So what shall I do? What is worth doing? For me, that's teaching, whether it's in the classroom, as I did for 21 years at several colleges and universities, whether it's in workshops that I create myself. I like to receive the kind of feedback I got from Mary a couple of years ago that my life actually was useful, that I did something honorable. I was compassionate in my approach, and apparently it made some difference, at least to Mary. I hope that you are able to pursue the same sort of activities that will enrich your life and the lives of the people around you. Thank you. Okay. At the edge of extinction, only love remains and puppies. The next part of our presentation is methane. It is Picturesque Motutapu Island, lined by dozens of dead pine trees. The Department of Conservation poisoned them in 2015 to prevent them spreading, but now their skeletons haunt skipper Kevin Hester. There's no question about it. There's the potential for a catastrophic accident to take place, and it's avoidable. That's why we're having this conversation now. Kevin's worried a storm will loosen their roots and push them over the edge. Methane is an odorless colourless substance. There's only around 20 permanent residents here and they're all from different walks of life. Some of them get around by car and some of them by buggy. But they've all got one thing in common. They're passionate about keeping the island pest free. Kevin has lived here for five years and knows only too well how quickly the pests can take over. Well, the classic example is a few years ago we had a plague skink invasion on the island where a builder brought out a relocatable building. It took us months to prove that we had eradicated them. And it costs a lot of money. Being pest free means native birds can thrive. This is an incredibly melodious island to live on. It's just like having music playing in the background. Oh. <clears throat> this is not <clears throat> methane. This is an odorless, colorless substance called metaphor. Okay? Underneath my favorite tree, and this is where I come to process feelings of grief, sadness, celebrate joy. I'm glad I have Guy and Pauline in this community. It really helps me to do what I need to do and to feel connected. And um, 
I feel very fortunate to have come across the message of love and urgency and living with death in mind. Methane is a greenhouse gas and it is some 100 times more powerful than CO2. There is no one on Earth knows how to freeze the Arctic back.